Hey there, I'm Scott. This is Tangents. Well, Brian uh, mentioned last time that he was concerned uh, from my last few uh, of these that maybe I was a little tired and kind of like stretched thin, which I took as a little bit of a red flag that maybe maybe that's con you know the thing to to be worried about. Um, I appreciate that, by the way. But uh, I, well, working on it. I am stretched very thin. I'm trying to oh, trying to get a bunch of stuff done. Uh, currently, like I have a ton of projects and slow progress on all of them, but there is at least some hope that the team will be growing uh, further, and then you know, like I I might be more and more out of the loop on some of this kind of day to day grindy detail stuff, and we're kind of working on trying to line things up so I'm not stretched as thin. So all of that said, uh, definitely not over yet, but um, there's at least some light at the end of the tunnel maybe at some point, like hopefully by like the end of the year or something um, might not be as ridiculous. And we're also hoping that toward the end of the year, um, I'll be in a position where I can take a vacation again, which I'm really looking forward to, especially given that I I'm fully vaccinated now. So, and, and when I say that, it's not just that I've had both shots, but it's also two weeks, uh, well, Sunday. So not quite there yet, but pretty much. Uh, good, two weeks post Pfizer. Uh, had no impact at all on the second Pfizer. So was a little nervous about that, but, and I know plenty of people who had some issues, but for me, like, did not even notice it. And in fact, the first one, I felt like my arm was punched and the second one, uh, I don't know if I was just more relaxed or what. I, I don't know if I did anything differently or if it was just like by chance where they happened to do the IM injection, but whatever it was, felt fine. So uh, my arm didn't even hurt. And uh, yeah, feeling pretty good about that. I, I, I will say I, the first shot that I got, I had a little like lightning, um, you know, just kind of smile on my face. And the second one I was like, I'm not a break dance kind of like flipping out relaxed guy, uh, celebratory kind of person, but I felt really much better. I felt a relief that I didn't expect to feel. And I certainly also, I don't know, it's, it's not something, I, I've not been like that freaked out about all of this, or at least not that I was aware of. I definitely you know, have been taking precautions, I've, you know, masking up and doing all that kind of stuff. But I felt uh, felt lightened. I felt a lot better than I expected to feel about it. And so, and my mom said kind of the same thing. I felt when when she got her second vaccine a while back, um, or second dose, I, I felt so much relief. Like I, I can't even tell you. I, it's been something that's been that has been weighing on my mind. Me personally, getting this, um, assuming I didn't have it last year when I had the kind of weird anomalous positive test and it felt a little off, um, which I, I still don't know if it was a false positive or, or what, but aside from that, I, in, you know, I don't know, felt a lot of relief. I, I know I have, you know, I have asthma and I get pretty much every year, except for this year, I get like a head cold or something kind of recover from that and then through post nasal drip or whatever gets into my lungs. And for like a month, I will have this horrible horse cough and bronchitis. And you know, it's just like this terrible, you know, sounds, sounds like I'm dying. Sounds like I've got tuberculosis or something. Pretty much okay, but it makes me, you know, definitely put me at higher risk for COVID and also made me a little bit anxious about, you know, like if I did get this and things went badly, they could go pretty badly. I mean, it's true of anyone, but you know, it's a pre-existing condition that I was at least aware of. Uh, seem to have lucked out. I am cautiously optimistic. Wow, well, not that optimistic. I mean, if you look at India, it's scary how bad things are. And uh, awkward laugh. And, and then you look at uh, how many people still are just maskless and going about their lives like this is nothing. So we have a huge reservoir where people are spreading this shit. And then you have a bunch of vaccinated people now. Um, and this is something that does mutate. 
it's a, it's an RNA virus. So RNA based um, polymerases tend to be much, they, ha they have a higher mutation rate than uh, using DNA as a template. So things mutate, you get a bunch of strains and all it takes is one of those strains to be able to evade vaccine surveillance and um, be relatively easy to transmit. And you have a huge population of vaccinated people. You know, you start doing some math and you're like, it, it probably, hopefully won't happen, but it scares the shit out of me. I, I really would be upset if, um, if that does arise. And, uh, you know, we have, because we haven't wiped this shit out like we could have or should have, um, you know, maybe it's simmering down and then flares up again in a bad way. Um, but hopefully that is just a, you know, bit of like excess worry that's not necessary. Freaks me out a little bit though. Um, so I have some, um, some stuff that I'm working on for video coming up. It's going to be a little bit different format. Um, it's mainly a couple of things that I just wanted to work on and they're going to be, uh, not like super high production, but a little more refined, a little bit more work put into it and uh, really talking about some things that I, I could just talk about them like this, but I want to show some visuals and I want to do, uh, I want to capture some stuff. The problem with that is of course, it's predicated on me having a lot of time to set some stuff up. Uh, so it's something I've been kind of teeing up for a while, but it's going to be at least a few weeks till I get that. Um, my mom and sister are coming into town actually in a couple weeks. So um, I will definitely have one of these next week. And then there might be a small interruption. I might bank a couple up just to avoid that. Uh, but, you know, it's coming, it's on the, the near horizon. Um, I had lunch with Gil. We didn't eat at a restaurant last week, but we did meet on campus and walked around, did our walk and talk thing. Um, fucking awesome to be back to that. And it's, it's amazing also, like, uh, I don't know, there, there are people, there are people who you know for a while and you kind of like, you're not that comfortable with, or you, you, even if you hang out with them relatively often, you don't have that much to say to them. Somehow Gil and I can just, you know, talk almost endlessly. And we can also, you know, put it on, I, I go to Paris or we have a pandemic and we don't see each other for over a year. And then you meet up again and it's like, go, um, just picking up where you left off. Uh, like no time has passed almost in a weird way. And I, I like that. There's, I don't have a lot of people like that in, uh, you know, not my life just now, but just going back over the whole history of my life. So I really, when you have something like that, it's really nice. It's, uh, yeah, I enjoy it. Um, some work side stuff I don't want to talk about. Uh, yeah, it's, it's not that there's anything bad there. It's just like, there are things that I could bring up that, um, you know, social things or, you know, like things with customers or things with uh, potential investors. Um, I, I actually, I will talk about investors very briefly, and I'm going to use that to segue into what I want to talk about today, which is running. And I don't mean running in the sense of actually running, which is something that I don't, I've never been able to get into. I, I ran a 5k on a treadmill once. Um, in Austin, actually, when I was, I was going to a thing that was like a, yeah, kind of had a soft job offer that I could have, uh, taken. I'm really glad in retrospect I didn't, but could have done that. Um, but anyway, I, that was like the extent of my running. Uh, Gil actually runs. My friend, uh, John, who I climb with, um, is like an ultra marathon guy. Uh, and actually... I haven't done it yet, but in the nearest future, I think we're going to go climbing again because he just got, he got his second shot, uh, I think the day before I got mine or something. So we're both kind of teeing up there. I'm, I'm super excited about that too. I haven't been climbing in again over a year. And that's something I used to do, you know, for a long time, a couple times a week. And I miss it. I, I do miss also though, I, I live, this is going to end um, probably like September-ish, but for now I live in Gilbert. Uh, which if you don't know Phoenix, it's not just that it's physically removed from like ASU, but it's also very, where I live, 
in terms of like distance, in terms of like absolute distance, not that far from a lot of stuff, but it still takes me like 15 minutes just to get to the freeway because of the way things are set up. And it, it's actually remarkably bad. It, it's just like, I used to live uh, literally five minute drive from the rock gym. And uh, you know, I mean like you could almost, it was a little bit, maybe, maybe it was 10 or 15 if there was traffic. Uh, wasn't something that was close enough that I quite wanted to bike to it, although probably could have. But it was close enough that, you know, going was not a big deal. Where I am now, if I want to go climbing, it's 15 minutes just to get to the freeway and then another 10 to 15 minutes to get to the rock gym, even with no traffic. And so that means if I go climbing for like an hour or two, so I go climbing for two hours, um, that's an extra hour tacked onto that. So whatever it is, like I don't have a ton of time anyway, and then it's like an extra hour on top of that back and forth just to be able to go. Yeah, it, it's, uh, it's something that even before the pandemic, I kind of really ramped down on. And it didn't help also that I have a lot of uh, the people that I climbed with, you know, people progress in their lives and they get to other things. One guy moved like way out to North Scottsdale and was no longer going back and forth by the rock gym. Uh, that's a long drive, even compared to here. And there's a rock gym way out there. He's probably not coming back anytime soon. Um, other people like um, John just had another kid, um, and, which is also crazy because I remember I remember when he was talking about the first one, it's like trying and it's like, uh, and then all of a sudden it's like, oh, uh, his wife is pregnant. Oh, uh, had the kid. And now that's been years. It's just like crazy how that works. Um, I guess time in general, just even though it's the most mundane and simple and obvious thing in the world, it blows my mind continuously. Um, but you know, things happen. People are not able to be as engaged and you know, people start working from home or they get to a different stage of life and, you know, or they've graduated or they've gone on, their, their postdoc is over now, they're a professor someplace, and they leave, and now they're no longer able to climb, or, you know, whatever. Or one of the people in the group that you climb with has a Android phone, and they switch over to WhatsApp. This was a, yeah. They switch over to WhatsApp because that one person didn't like the iMessages thing, and then I, I, just on principle, I have a bunch of friends, a bunch of international friends who use WhatsApp. I hate it. I don't know why I hate it, but I have never liked it. Uh, and I took it off my phone a long time ago. And I don't want to put it back on. So that pretty much killed that group of climbing friends. You know, like I, if I was, if I happened to be at the gym at the same time as them, I'd climb with them. But uh, as soon as that happened, just, you know, no longer in the group chat and um, yeah, that's done. So little things like that happen. I guess it's like entropy. It's hard to maintain, which also I'm mean, going back to Gil. It's, it's so weird how, you know, he and I have maintained this um, sort of friendship over the years. And in that case, it's so easy, like almost effortless. And, you know, you look at these other things where it's like friendly acquaintances and just, or, or even friends. And, you know, it's like, due to constraints of life or whatever, it's very hard to stay in touch and to keep, you know, stay engaged. Uh, I have a, I, I consider him a friend. He moved to, um, he and his now wife, um, that's a crazy thing, went to his wedding, you know, and that was like a blink ago, but it was actually years now. Uh, he and his wife moved to the Bay Area and I pretty much haven't seen them since, even when he comes to town um, and, you know, the circle of friends that he hangs out with. I'm in that circle of friends, but for whatever reason, uh, just kind of like time and entropy. Don't really, you know, hang out that much. Haven't seen him or even talked to him in probably, you know, years, actually. And you just think about that. It's, uh, it's interesting to me. But anyway, about running. So running, and I want to talk about running for office. And the reason I want to do this, um, President Biden just had his address, um, like not exactly 100 days, but almost 100 day address to Congress uh, yesterday. And I'm recording this on the 29th of April, 2021. And uh, I just have to say it that way, I'm sorry. 
And yeah, I, I didn't watch the address. I, even when it's somebody like Bernie, I've, I've gotten, I don't know what it is. I don't know if my attention span has gotten really bad or, or what. I, I listen to podcasts. I still read some things, uh, although I, I do notice that my, uh, my ability to read through even just an article that's decently long, uh, like I can make it through, but my attention, I, I used to be able to just like read through and I'd not, not just read, but I would like skim and retain and it'd be fast and easy and took no effort. I mean, it, literally, it was like effortless. It was just like, shoop, and done. Now, if there's something that I'm interested in and I want to read it, I'll, and, and even if it's like, you know, say 10 pages long, I'll go to it, I'll read the first uh, couple of paragraphs, and then I'll get bored, I'll go over, do something else. And like, I have to fight myself to get back to reading it. And then going through, you know, I, have, I keep having the impulse to switch over to something else. And if I do force myself to plow through, it's like a lot of effort. I've uh, I've definitely lost something there. I kind of think it's probably to blame like on Twitter or uh, something like this. Maybe it's also just getting older. Um, I I do notice, uh, yeah, and this goes into friendships and acquaintances as well. But when I was younger, I did a lot. Of, I put up with a lot of stuff that I didn't. Um, yeah, not that reading equates to this, but. Like I would go with people to parties or to bars or something and people that I didn't really care that much about or wasn't that interested in. And granted, part of it was, you know, like a social experience and maybe even meeting people. And I did meet people that way who ended up being friends for a long time. But yeah, I would go and do a lot of stuff like this and I'd tolerate just kind of sitting around bored and not, you know, like you're at Four Peaks. I love going to Four Peaks, going to Four Peaks with Gil. I'm excited about that. Um, tomorrow, but we go to Four Peaks or something with a bunch of people from graduate school and you know, there'd be like one or two people that I'd like to talk to and you might not even sit next to them. And the people that I like to talk to were kind of these hub people who are really social and they'd like to talk to everybody. So it's like everybody likes to talk to them. And if you're not right next to them in the table, even if you are actually, their attention is divided. But if you're not right next to them, you're, you're not talking to them. And then you get a couple people who are kind of quiet next to you. And it's just like, okay, this is, it's not even a personal thing. It's just like, this is not too exciting. I'm not, uh, I don't really have any, and you know, we would try like make a good faith effort to try to talk, but say some things, you hit the ball against the drapes and it falls down a couple times. And then you're just like, okay, well, this is awesome. So yeah, I, I used to put up with that and now I, I say this a lot, but uh, I, I used to desperately want to get invited to shit. And now most of the time I get invited to shit and I'm like, um, which happens much more often. Well, not, last year notwithstanding. Happens much more often now than it used to. Um, although it has been tapering off because I think people are getting the message. But now most of the time I just don't want to go. And I don't go often. Um, sometimes I, There are things that I do go to that are interesting or important to me, but for the most part, no. Nah. But anyway, running. So, you know, Biden, I'm not a huge fan of. Uh, you might have gathered that from, from me. But there are certain things that I do think are positive that, you know, he, some things he's accomplished. Yeah, kind of, yeah. But also, and some of it is, there's a lot of framing and spin. But he did say some things like, um, you know, we, he was pushing for a $15 minimum wage. In fact, uh, made an executive order that uh, for federal employees, uh, $15 is now the minimum wage. So that's good. It's uh, $15, don't get me wrong, is low, but compared to like 11 bucks, it's a big fucking difference. Um, you know, he, he said healthcare is a human right. Now he's still pushing for ACA, which is just like a massive, you know, and COBRA and these kinds of things just massively funding these insurance parasites, uh, but said the right words, you know, um, there are other things like that that, you know, I, now I, I don't believe the police are reformable, but talk about things like this. And then, you know, you look at that and at least he's kind of saying some of the right things. Um, yeah, I don't know. I feel, what I wanted to talk about is not specifically that, but it's kind of the thing that made me think about this. On Twitter, um, I'm in kind of you know, 
generally speaking, the, the biggest circle that I'm in is sort of lefty Twitter, yeah. And there are some overlapping rings there, but like I, I have people who are super into Biden, they feel really good about all this stuff, sort of like the liberal people, and um, you know, like blue no matter who kind of people. Picked those up a while ago. Um, for some reason, they still follow me, but you know, it's pretty, not that I ever was not putting my, you know, who I am and what I believe in out there, but there are a lot of people that are kind of like in that, but they, they also, you know, kind of agree with me about things. So they're kind of like maybe in their mind pragmatic, but still, you know, or also you don't have to fully like everybody or agree with everything they say. But anyway, they're there. Um, we have people who are, you know, in, in terms of lefties, like crazy lefties, um, you know, like literally communists and anarcho-communists. Anarcho -com I can't say the word. Anarcho-communists. And uh, anarcho syndical syndical I, I can't say the word syndicatist syndicalist Synd imagine that I said it correctly um, but there are a bunch of people in a bunch of these circles to varying degrees you know like there are democratic socialists and you know like people who are varying varying degrees one big group and I do think they're more vocal than big but I definitely see them a lot and I don't like it is uh, sort of this Ryan Knight, uh, Jimmy Dor, Dory, Dor, however the fuck you say his name, kind of group of people who are forced the vote is their big thing. Um, they're, I would say, actively, you know, just complaining and not really doing much that's productive. So, you know, they get up and they yell at AOC and the squad and, you know, they're like, force the vote, damn it. And I do, don't get me wrong, I do think they have more power than they're exercising because you look at what uh, McCinema and Mansion, McMansion, um, are, are doing and accomplish with just a couple votes. But they're also in the Senate and they also, you know, like their votes actually count. Whereas in the House, you have like, if you're going to be generous, like a half dozen people out of 435, um, it's, it's not like they have huge amounts of power that they can wield. And it's not also like if they got together and didn't vote for shit, uh, you could still put together, Pelosi could still put together a coalition that would, you know. And if you step on her, which she doesn't need to be stepped on, but if you upset her and, you know, it's like that whole, if you go for, if you go for the king, don't miss. Um, not to misgender her, but, yeah, you, if you're going to do something with Pelosi, like try not to get her elected speaker, you'd better not get her elected speaker because if you try that and you miss, then I would imagine maybe they can keep getting reelected, maybe not, but their careers in terms of ability to do anything would probably just be dead. So I see these people and, you know, and, and again, I do agree, could do a little bit more, but they're like over the top, they hate this, they, they hate everything about electoralism. Um, these are also a group of people who are constantly doing things like hashtag uh, general strike. Now, they're not actually organizing a general strike. They're not actually doing anything that's going to lead to a general strike ever actually happening. Uh, and I think it should. But they hashtag general strike. And I, I've, I've put a hashtag general strike out as well, like earlier when people were talking about this stuff, thinking naively that someone was actually putting it together. But it's much easier to just tweet hashtag general strike than to actually work with unions and, uh, you know, get people on board with it and get people prepared to be able to do a general strike. Uh, and, and also like an annoying thing, it, there, it needs lead time, right? Uh, it needs a lot of lead time. And four or five months ago, I saw people talking about like, oh, we should make May Day a general strike. Well, you know, that's enough lead time that you could probably make it happen at that time. Now, May Day is, well, it's the 29th, so it's right across, like, you know, right over the corner, and nobody's done fucking anything, as far as I can tell. Maybe, maybe magically, I'm wrong, and, like, it'll happen, and it's been all under the, in the woodwork, and you didn't even see it. That would be awesome. Um, I'd love to, I'd love to see that, but I don't think so. I, don't, I think they're just like, uh, you know, we'll talk about a bunch of shit, but we won't actually do anything. And then 
people do that kind of stuff. Or they get AOC and uh, Omar and Rashad and a couple of people who are really awesome, in my opinion. You know, not perfect, but they have good things about them. Get them elected, and then they're like, oh, well, you, you're, again, five people, well, handful of people out of 435. And you're like, you can't, you haven't done anything. You haven't completely controlled Congress. You don't have a fucking, you, it's not even that you have a large coalition. You have a small little group of people who aren't completely on the same page about everything. And even if they all decided to work as one, they're still not that powerful in Congress. You need to get a lot more people into office. And people see this and they're like, oh, well, fuck this. They, they're, you know, again, five people or a handful of people. And you're like, oh, well, this, we're done. We're done. It, no, doesn't work. Let's just stop trying to, let's primary them. Again, the only good thing about this is the people saying this aren't going to do shit. They're sitting there like, oh, we'll primary AOC. Good fucking luck. Good fucking luck primarying AOC. Um, but, you know, you're going to try this. You're going to fail. Um, you're not even, the thing is, they're not even really going to try. I, like, somebody might try to run. It's going to be somebody, like, going up against AOC is like, it's like, it's like trying, it, it, you know, somebody who jogs a little bit trying to run against Usain Bolt, right? You're, you're probably not, it's probably not a realistic idea. And even if you were going to be able to do it, you're not going to be, you know, it, it's going to need a lot of work. You're going to need a shit ton of time and effort and all of this. And again, you're probably not going to do it. And... You try to do it and you're going to fail probably. And then you failed and now you're, you know, a pariah, basically. I mean, you know, AOC is not going to really be that inclined to work with you. I would imagine. You could imagine also, like, if you did even, to, you know, get like 5%, 10% of the vote and it's like a three-way split, you could help uh, get a super, like, um, you know, just like establishment dem to take her place, that'd be fucking great. So, yeah, if you're gonna do it, do it right. But the thing I wanna talk about is I ran for office in 2018, and there are a lot of things that I didn't do right. I will say, you know, absolutely. Looking back, um, there are a lot of things I could have done differently. Some of them were also just constraints, like I didn't have the money to pay somebody. So, I if I was gonna do it again, I would absolutely want to have a full-time employee who's doing the organization, doing the fundraising, you know, basically like a campaign manager. You can have like volunteers. I had, I had a bunch of volunteers and they were great and I really appreciated their time and effort, but I kind of squandered it also because I didn't have somebody managing this stuff and I didn't have somebody growing this stuff. Like if you're with things like this, if you're not actively growing it, it's withering and it's dying. And then you know, you, you look at what's involved in running and I, I'm very impressed with, I think the fact that I ran makes me more impressed with the people who, um, like AOC, ran and won. Because AOC, and again, she is pretty extraordinary in terms of just natural ability and it's a combination of natural ability and willingness to do the work and, you know, develop those abilities. She she did a great thing, I think. And you look at what she did, and granted she had the New York DSA, who are pretty solid, well-organized, you know, group, they could actually collect the signatures. So let's let's say you want to run for office. And it, some of the people that I'm talking to, I know some of the people that watch and listen to this, well, I guess there aren't that many people that watch it, but the people that listen to this. I know a couple of people who either they have run or um, their wife has run or, or similarly, or they know people who've run. So you have some glimpse into this, but for people other than those, uh, and also, you know, just to talk to everyone, you know, if you're going to run, you have to, th there's a certain threshold of like organizing your, um, your campaign committee, figuring out how to do the paperwork, all of this kind of stuff, doing the reporting. And all of these are just, they're not hard, 
But if you've never done them before, you could totally do them. You could totally figure it out. I did it. If I can do it, you can do it probably. But it's definitely a lot of work. And if somebody, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna contrast this with say uh, McCinema type person running. So here's a person who has a shit ton of money, a lot of experience, a lot of people um, in the party who are beholden to her, a lot of people who, you know, can help with these things. So if she wants to organize a campaign committee, which she doesn't have to do anymore, but if she did, like a new one, um, done. Like basically just say, let's do it. Somebody does it, it's done. Everything is kosher. That's a big thing too. It's really easy to be out of compliance if you don't know what the fuck you're doing. It's really easy not to have, like if you don't have an accountant. And an accountant, you know, in terms of like, if you've got millions of dollars in the bank, not that much. But if you've got some, you know, thousands of dollars, you're spending all your money on an accountant just to run the, the campaign finances and to make sure that you're not violating campaign law. Um, I know like when I ran, I had a couple people, I had one guy from Israel and a couple of other people who were international who wanted to, to make a contribution. And it'd be super, like, I didn't accept it obviously because you can't, it's a FEC violation, but it'd be super easy to imagine someone who didn't do that research accidentally accepting something from somebody like that. And then you have a bomb in your, in your finances that could really fuck you up and you probably don't have the resources to fix it. You know, if, if McCinema fucks something up like that, which probably wouldn't happen because she's got accountants and people who are professionals, if something did get fucked up, she's got a whole team of people ready to unfuck it. You know, whereas you, you're running your own little campaign, you're gonna have to unfuck that yourself. Good fucking luck. You, you Again, you can do it, but it's a big deal. And even if you're getting attorneys to work pro bono, it's still a big deal. How are you gonna find the person who's qualified to do that stuff and who's gonna do it for free? And especially if it's not something that is like, you know, just a matter of filing a brief or something. You know, it's an ongoing kind of pain in the ass. So you get that. Um, having like McCinema has connections all over the place, both directly and then just by virtue of being super chummy with people in the party, a lot of people willing to help her in a lot of places, even in places where they're not supposed to be partisan, you know, versus you're some rando, rando fuckwad. They're like, uh, yeah, I'm not gonna bend over to help you at all. So a lot of these like institutional advantage, advantages for someone like that. Um, signatures. If I wanna run for office, and I even, I, I thought about running for state house or, um, or state senate, which is a much lower threshold than running for Congress in terms of signature requirements. Still a lot of signatures, um, but it's not as many. But you wanna run, you need to collect those signatures. Uh, for McCinema, she wants to run, I, I don't even, I, I'd be shocked. Like maybe she goes to a speech and gets some signatures just you know for shits and giggles. But for the most part, I don't think she has to, if she didn't want to, get all the signatures, no effort, um, wouldn't have to ever touch a petition wouldn't have to ever file anything. Um, you know, all of this kind of stuff that if you're an individual running, you'd have to do. Uh, you know, Deidre Abood ran for Senate against uh, McSinema in the primary uh, the first time. And she did a kind of Herculean amount of effort, like traveled all over the state, shit ton of work. Still, you know, she got the signatures, although it was a monumental effort again. Um, it's amazing that she even got on the ballot because of that. And she did great, but she got like 20% of the votes or 25% of the votes, mainly annoyingly because uh, and you talk to a bunch of fucking Democrats. Uh, yeah, it just like, makes me cringe here. Talk, about, talk to a bunch of these people and they're like, oh, well, I, this is something that I've heard so many times. It just disgusts me and I wanna yell at people. And, you know, I, I really hope while you're listening, you're not saying, oh, yeah, they're right, Scott. But they're not right. You know, it's like, I'm not racist, but all the people in the state are, you know, or in this case, I'm not Islamophobic, but the state is. And you get these kinds of bullshit things, and they're total bullshit. I mean, it, it, one thing I see all the time on Twitter as well is like, you know, well, okay, the coastal version of lefties are crazy left. They're not 
that far left, by the way, but they, you know, they say that. Um, the things that like I want, I, in this country, I look far left. I want things that are just bog fucking standard around the world. You know, I want to not pay a fifth of our GDP and like twice as much per person for shitty healthcare. Yeah. Call me crazy. I want to not be like exclusive in the developed world. Uh, I, I don't want to have our fucking military be so funded that we could cut it in half and still have it be more funded than China with the next biggest military. It's ridiculous. And also like our military, you know, we're spending all this money. At least if we were getting something for it, it it'd be something like, I, I'd still not say it was worth it, but at least if like anyone ever tried to fight us, they would get wiped out. Um, that's something in reality. You know, it's not been tested in a long time, and we have a lot of things like the F-35, uh, Bradley fighting vehicle, and these kinds of things where it's just a bunch of money going to a bunch of contractors, and they're making a bunch of crap that we don't need, um, M1, Abrams, and this kind of stuff, making crap that we don't need or don't want, and then also, it's kind of crap. So, yeah, it, if we ever actually had a war again, I, I mean, you know, obviously we've had wars, we have endless wars, but... These are all against adversaries who, you know, it's, it's like the, the bully in high school beating up on a kindergartner. Like, you know, okay, you did it. Good fucking, you know, that's good for you. You've accomplished something. Try it with somebody your own size um, and see how that goes. And it's a, like, I, I don't have any confidence at all that we would do that well, to be honest. Uh, or if we did do well, yeah, it would not be like it would be after getting our asses handed to us and then coming back, assuming we had a chance to come back, uh, which could definitely be optimistic. It might not, you know, like maybe you just don't have a chance to come back. You just get knocked down and you're fucked. And also, also the fact that, you know, like this last year, you see how little people are willing to sacrifice for other people. Um, you know, like World War II, the greatest generation and all of this stuff. You look at what people sacrificed and, you know, comparatively speaking, a lot. And you look now and people, like, won't wear a fucking mask for people. I mean, you know, just like making a tiny little... To call it a sacrifice is just, it's not even, you know, it's just like barely inconvenience, inconvenience yourself a little bit. Have a year. Uh, and really the thing here is like, spend six... If we would ever have just spent six to eight weeks on a hard lockdown and, you know, like actually shut things down like Australia or, um, you know, Taiwan or New Zealand or wherever the fuck you want to go. Like these places that, or China, you know, people pick on China, but China did a, a remarkably good job. If, if China had our death rate or our infection rate from COVID, they alone would have as many deaths as the, because their population is so big they alone would have as many deaths as we've had worldwide, um, or at least like two thirds of that. So into the hundreds of thousands versus, you know, tens of thousands. It's, it's, you know, it's a big fucking thing to look at. If we had their rate, then our death toll would be in the low thousands, I think is so, yeah. So anyway, going back from this, you want to run for office. Uh, you, ha you gotta get those signatures. Okay, you get the signatures, which again, monumental task. And it doesn't have to be, but it's a pretty big deal. If you don't have the resources to do that, and you don't have the organization to do it, uh, it's gonna be hard. So say you got the signatures, and now you have to do the marketing. And just to do the marketing takes a lot of money, takes a lot of you know time and effort, which is fine, but also, you know, if it basically means that if you want to do this kind of thing, it's almost a full-time job to campaign. Even and that's true, even even for someone like McSinema. Um, yeah, it's one of the gross things about our, our government, actually, that uh, if somebody's in the house, you know, they have a two-year term, and they're running for office almost immediately, and a significant like they're they've got like a month or sorry, we've got like a quarter of the year off, paid vacation essentially, they're spending that time or more campaigning 
Every day they're doing call time. Call time is not working for us. It's just literally like raising money and talking to donors, basically, and getting, you know, getting goodwill, getting support for things. Um, which is, I guess, part of the job, but it's not really part of what the fuck we're paying them for. Um, so they do this, and you think about, like, okay, you're a regular person. You don't have a ton of money socked away. And we have, in our country, we have most people have no, you know, like, if you quit your job, maybe if you're running month to month, you're fucked. What are you going to do? Are you just going to quit your job, and can you... Can you even subsist without having a job? Most people, the answer is no. And and so you've got that. If you have money socked away, you probably don't have enough to hire a campaign manager. And so it becomes a full-time job for you and probably a couple of other volunteers at least. And you got to get somebody who, like, volunteers are great. Um, but when you're paying somebody, you can expect them to work 40 hours a week plus. Whereas if they're volunteers, they have, you know, unless they're independently wealthy or retired, uh, and even if they are, they probably aren't interested in spending, you know, a full-time job working on this thing. But you imagine they're like, okay, I'm going to spend 40 hours a week on this thing that I'm not getting paid for. Um, and it's going to be hard and grindy and not very rewarding. And even if you do it all right, the odds of winning are low. Um, so you need the marketing, you need to do all this stuff. It's not that trivial. It's, it's something like I see people who say, if you don't like things, run for office. And I do think you should, by all means. And I do think also like it's easy to lose sight of things like school boards, like school board seats. Almost anyone could contend. Like you, if you were interested in doing it, you might be able to win. Um, pretty much anyone watching this. And the, the problem there is, of course, it's like, okay, it's still a lot of effort to do. And once you've done it, you know, I, I can only speak for Arizona because this is the one that I know the most about, but the school boards are just fucking nightmare. Like, there are these people on them who are intentionally trying to dismantle public schools and fucking things up, and they're doing, you know, like, killing sex ed and do, you know, get, well, sex ed, they'll make, like, um abstinence only kind of stuff instead of comprehensive medically accurate sex ed as they they should have and so you have to even if you have a majority of people you're still going to be fighting with these people so you're signing up and doing a lot of work in order to get a job that's going to be a pain in the ass uh, similarly you want to run for the state legislature which is i think a noble thing and it's something again i've considered it but you do it and you got to deal with a bunch of assholes and it's going to be very painful and grindy and, you know, not very rewarding. And you've done, and it's not like, um, it's not like Congress where you're getting paid 175 K per year, plus great benefits, plus, you know, again, three months of vacation and all this other shit. Um, you know, the state legislature here, it's like a, you know, as a, if you tried to do that as your only job, you'd be poor, like super, super poor. And of course, it's not like all year round, it's a, a brief uh, session. So it, it's nice in the sense that it means that the legislators in principle are not, you know, they're like normal citizens who go in and they're not professional politicians as much, but they end up being professional politicians because it's so much work. And once you've built up the infrastructure to do it, um, you know, it, it, it's much easier to go from winning once to winning again Still a lot of work, but at least you've got the infrastructure built. You've proven yourself. So people, you know, if you're a rando and you're like, hey, give me some money so that I can run for office. Even if somebody believes in you and they like you, it's like, eh, okay, here's 10 bucks. You know, they're probably not going to get like big checks. And if you don't get big checks, you know, it's like, oh, well, Bernie's getting all these $27 checks and he's making a shit ton of money. Yeah, but he's fucking Bernie and he's in a national campaign. You're somebody running for local office, um, you know, and you're not, you don't have a lot of name recognition, all this kind of stuff. Even if you get some $27 checks, you know, you get a hundred of them and it starts adding up to still, you know, like um, not that much money. It's enough money that you can, you got to get hundreds of those per month just to barely have a campaign running. 
And that's without doing anything. I mean, it's, you know, like, it's just like the minimal subsistence amount. Big checks are nice, especially if you're a small candidate. Um, and you just think about, is one of the reasons why, like, I, I despise McCinema. I do understand why she does some of the things she does, because what she does, um, like it or hate it, you know, having all of these things and going to the big donors and getting all that money, um, it makes things a lot easier. You know, it's a much nicer path if you're not interested in actually helping changing things and you just want to stay in office and keep a cushy job and have, you know, like a nice, uh, nice amount of money there and so have some, you know, have some juice, then by all means, hers is a path. Um, it's a shitty path, but it's a path. So anyway, um, and, and then this is without even talking about trying to run independent because because we have first passed the post, um, you know, we have this plurality voting system. If you're running as an independent, first off, I mean, the signature requirement is ridiculously high. It's already high for everything else as a, as a normal candidate, but it's much, much higher. And you've got to convince people to vote for you. You go directly to the general, which means you're risking vote splitting as well. Um, you don't have, there, there's something useful about having a primary just in the sense of it kind of tests your machinery and it makes sure, you know, it's, it's also a victory. If you go through the primary, you win, you go to the general with a W, <clears throat> with a w versus if you're an independent, <clears throat> you go directly to the general, uh, at least in Arizona. <clears throat> Holy hell, this has been happening a lot lately. I think it's, uh, I think it's allergies, but it's annoying me. Anyway. You go to the general and uh, you've not won at all. Somebody whose name people probably don't recognize. And it's, it's hard. You know, I, I do think in my district, uh, which is Andy Biggs's district, I think you could probably do decently well as an independent if you were a serious candidate. But it's one of these cases also where like if somebody's serious and they're putting in the time, effort, and money, they're probably gonna run on a partisan ticket because, you know, it's like, why not? Um, and then you end up with John Green or somebody terrible, um, like John Green. So anyway, with that, God, speaking of John, well, I, I'm, I'm not gonna, no need to, no need to go further on that. Um, I don't like people following the McCinema model. Let's just say that. Um, so anyway, with that, uh, I will talk more about this later for sure. I, it is amazing to me how much, and this is, you know, I, I, a lot of aging things don't bother me, at least not yet. But one that does is when I was younger, I could stand and it was no big deal. You know, it's like standing, okay, big fucking deal. Now I stand for this long and my back hurts. My back hurts just from standing here. And if I had a camera that uh, was tracking me, which maybe I should do, at least, you know, <laughs> that wouldn't happen. But uh, with this, it's like, great. I got to kind of stand in place and, you know, perfect. So anyway, that's enough of my bitching for now. I will talk with you in a week. And uh, I'm sure this other thing that I'm working on will not come out then. But, uh, well, I hopefully talking about it doesn't replace doing it. I'm trying not to say too much about it because I do worry, you know, you talk about, oh, I'm going to do X. And then you feel like you did it and then not, now you don't ever do it. Uh, looking forward to lunch tomorrow with Gil and certain things like that spinning back up. Uh, not looking forward to more meetings, but uh, yeah. Someday. Jaya, Jaya, Jaya. You know, I've been watching, uh, this will be the last thing I say, but uh, my partner had never seen Curb Your Enthusiasm. And uh, I've been watching a lot of uh, those with uh, with them. And... It's an interesting thing how good that show is. It's like, I, and I always loved it. I, I did, uh, you know, I, I wasn't hugely, I, like Leon the first season I kind of like tolerated and then after that he annoyed me when I saw it originally. And now, I don't know if it's just my perspective has changed or what, but he's actually really funny. I love the chemistry he has with Larry. Um, and then just like everything about that show, I just, the worst episode of Curb Your Enthusiasm, uh, for me, always, always is funny and good. 
And in the best ones, I'm just fucking dying laughing. It's just, if you, I know, well, probably if you're watching this or listening, you've, you've seen it, you're familiar with it, but it really holds up. I'd say if anything, it's actually gotten better with repetition. So, yeah, yeah, okay, okay. With that, um, I don't know what I wanted to say there, but I just thought I'd mention it. Um, going flying again, I've been doing, just to blather on a little bit more, I've been doing uh, cross country uh, again with my partner uh, once or once every two or so weeks. Uh, this is going to be the third trip we've gone on. Uh, did Sedona, did Payson, and now we're going to, um, I don't even know what it's called, Benson, a uh, place just uh, to the east of uh, Tucson. Uh, tomorrow, well, Saturday, assuming that everything is good. So looking forward to that. That's a, um, you know, I, I think a lot about it. I, I, I could talk at length about flying, but it, it's definitely something I like and uh, yeah, something to, to spend some time on. Uh, but with that, thanks again. Uh, I appreciate it as always. And uh, say again.